Good afternoon. I'm Adrienne Jeanette, a curator of the Brunier Art Museum here at Iowa State University at the University Museums. And I'm very honored to introduce Joyce J. Scott today as she shares insight into her world and artistry. There she is smiling for you. Uh, her solo exhibition, Joyce J. Scott Messages, is now open at the Brunier Art Museum and it's open until April 30th. And we are the first stop of three. So if you get a chance to be in Iowa and see it, please do. Otherwise, you have two other chances actually on the East Coast and West Coast. So we're, you're hitting all the, all the spots. Um, during Scott's career, she has been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and accolades for her work in the visual and performing arts. Born in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland, where she still works and lives, her career spans work in jewelry, glass, sculpture, installations, and performance. She is renowned for her ability to speak her mind through her art, to call out the stereotypes and inequalities that exist in this world, as a beadworker, her skill is exceptional, as witnessed in the many imaginative, imaginative neck pieces, wall pieces, and sculpture found in the exhibition. A 2016 recipient of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship has only increased her worldwide reputation. In 2019, Scott was named the Smithsonian Visionary Artist, an apt title for a woman whose vision and work continues to touch and expand the worlds of all that encounter her. <laughs> I want to thank Joyce Scott for agreeing to present with us tonight and Mobilia Gallery for developing this amazing exhibition. They paid me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I would also like to thank our University Museum's donors that made this exhibition possible. Frankie and Cal Parrott, Barbara and Roger Brini, H. Dieter and Renata Delman, Sarah Nusser and Michael King, Barbara Woods and University Museum's membership. Educational support is also generously provided by the Kathy and John Howe Art Enrichment Program. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Please mute yourself um, if you haven't already. And if we'll have time for questions and answers at the end and from um, Joyce. And so please type your questions into the chat function and I will try to read them off as I can to her. But right now I'm gonna share my screen and mute myself. Thank you. I'm not scared of dying and I don't really care. If it's peace you find and dying, well then let my time be near. If it's peace you find in dying, and if dying time is near, then bundle up my coffin, cause it's cold way down there. And when I die, and when I'm gone, there'll be one child born in this world to carry on. Hello, everybody. My name is Joyce J. Scott, and I'm carrying on the tradition of the visual and the performing arts. Nope, I shouldn't have done that. The visual and the performing arts of the Scott Caldwell family. You see pictures here of my parents and I when we were all young and innocent and perky. You know how long that lasts. Next, <laughs> Next my father's parents. Charlie Scott Sr. and Mamie Scott. They're from North Carolina. They were sharecroppers. They picked a lot of tobacco. Next. Now, my grandfather supposedly was someone who maybe carved. Uh, no, go go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, was, I'm going to have to be yelling now. People know that I yell during these slides. So when I say next, you just leave no, it no, on. I'm not yelling at you again, but when I come to your home, I'm going to hit you. I'm just telling you now. Okay. <laughs> My grandmother's quilt. Now, she made a lot of utilitarian quilts. You know, quilts were cheaper than blankets. Uh, when people look at this work, they say, ah, I know what traditional African-American artwork looks like, as if any one group has only one style yeah, of work. Some people haven't viewed on. So when I look at this, I understand what they mean. I, I think they're thinking about the Kenti cloth from Africa. They're, they're thinking about very prosaic articles, but no one group does one thing only. Next. These it's my mother's father, Samuel Scott Sr. They lived in South Carolina and they were also sharecroppers they picked a lot of cotton. In fact, supposedly the quilts that they made sometimes were made from the very cotton they picked because they just went to the mill 
and bought or swapped back fabric. Now, people talk about men not being quilters, but many times the men would be quilters. They lived in a small, almost cabin with 14 children. Two passed away, so a mom and a dad and 12 kids, that's 14 people in a small cabin. Probably the kitchen was halfway in the house and outside, and they had an outhouse. And when they wanted to quilt, they couldn't just, you know, have a whole stand set up. They had a quilting a frame that they would heist, as we say in the South, hoist and lower. Now, my mom says her most funnest time was to go under the quilt because that's where they'd make their samplers. They listen to all the family stories and they also sent up the needles that got stuck in or fell through the fabric. Now, my grandfather worked on the railroad. He has many jobs as he had children, right? 12 children. So he was a horse racer. He had some musician. He worked on the railroad. They were sharecroppers and he made white lightning, which is not an ethnic excursion. White lightning was the best drink in the world. I, all of a sudden I got like, you know, juicy mouth. Was the best drink in the world. Now, the Knight Riders always came into their neighborhoods to keep them in their own neighborhoods. They did not want Black people to gather. But my grandfather's elixir was supposedly so delish that they let him go around to the other houses as long as they got theirs. You look at his work, it's reminiscent of the strip weaving from Ghana again. And you see that yellow fabric. Uh, when they wanted to dye fabric, they couldn't go to the art store. He had to wait in the water, get some yellow ochre and dye that fabric. And that fabric is tattered. I didn't fix it because I wanted you to see it's layer and layer of fabric and quilt. So when an old quilt was tattered, it, it wasn't thrown away. It just became one more page in the book. Next, his wife, Mary Jane Caldwell was the person having the 14 babies. So she wasn't in the field a lot. She also made a lot of utilitarian fabric. Now, you know that when you're putting these things together, if they're just asleep under, they are more like abstract pieces, no rhyme or reason. There's not necessarily a pattern going on. My mom brought this from South Carolina when she moved to Maryland and she, like your parents tend to do, blame me for it being tattered and torn. She actually said to me, Joyce, if you love this, you ought to put a new page in the book. That means that fabric, a new layer, you ought to write on it, meaning I ought to stitch it because these are diaries for preliterate people. I mean, you know, how do you keep the stories of the family going? The Bible, there's so much only you can space, you can put in, people talk. They take fabric from the family. They might say, this fabric right here, Joyce, is your Uncle Benny's knee print right there. I didn't know him. Uncle Benny. I never met him. Stop yelling. Uncle Benny was really fabulous. He had a victory garden every summer, and he had the sourest tomatoes. He had so much cha-cha pickle. He, it, you don't know him as Daughters of Slug. You don't know him. So all those stitches represent a word a paragraph, a phrase, a story. Next, my mother, Elizabeth Caldwell Talford Scott, my mom, is a celebrated textile artist. This is a 50 year quilt she's photographed with. She said she dragged it with her wherever she went. She even taught me how to sew on it. There's the fabric from our lives. Next, now my mom did not adhere to the rules about what uh, traditional Western quilting is. She festooned them with anything she wanted, buttons, beads, rocks, knots, you name it. It was all about the holding, the sleeping under, the rolling around. The piece on our right, it's a prayer cloth. My mom made a lot of prayer cloths. You put it on your lap or if you're in the hospital, you lay it on you, you lay against it and you would pray. It would give you a kind of soothing 
a kind of warm feeling. Next. Now, then you get to me. Ha! Ah, Joyce Jane Scott, named after my maternal grandmother, Mary Jane Scott. I'm a roundaway girl living across the street from the projects. I was born in 1948, right? After Second World War, the Korean War. Those projects were built many times for servicemen to come back and had have a lease on their next step in life. My parents didn't read or write very well. They, they studied in one room schoolhouses when they weren't you know, out harvesting something. They even talked about having sheets put up between the kids. These are the very kids they've just been playing out in the field with, right? But their one room shack was segregated with a sheet. Folks, my mother started teaching me how to do art when I was just a, a, a five years old. Now I tell everybody I was uh, artist in utero, but boom, boom. I came out and I told the doctor, move, you're in my light. But bing, bing. I hope you're laughing. I can't tell a thing. I went back twice because I didn't like the first two takes. Sky got zing. Okay, I'll stop. My mom gave me a passport, the needle and the thread. Wherever I've gone in my life, there's always been somebody somewhere who's sewing, who's weaving, who's using a textile. These are molar pieces that I made. I went to graduate school in Mexico right after undergraduate school because my undergraduate degree was in education and I was sure I would be a 700 pound alcoholic if I taught middle school. So I did what any self-respecting hippie would do. I ran off to Mexico with other artists. I didn't think I was gonna to go to school but I went to San Miguel Allende in Guanajuato, Mexico. It was their first year of giving graduate degrees in crafts and fine arts, and I got one. That started my sojourn around the world. And I want you to know that I not only went to Mexico because I wasn't a smoker, I not only went to Mexico just to, to leave what I felt was a restraining kind of life in Baltimore, thinking, well, I'm going to have to be a teacher now. I went because I wanted to go to a country where people were all brown, basically. I also wanted to go to a, a place that had ancient culture right at your fingertips. I mean, you could really go downtown and you'd be uh, near a temple. You could go into the interior. There were people who were still wearing quipils and, and weaving the way they did hundreds of years ago. It was a true, true education, not just about crafts, but about humanity. I went to uh, work with the Kuna Indians on the San Blas Islands, around 300 island, islands off the coast of Panama. They have something that we call mola work. Well, mola is the name of the blouse. It's reverse applique. I took my molas there. Remember my needle, my needle and my thread. And they also do bead work. And I showed them my work. They laughed. I, you know, they called me a big Kuna because of the shape of my nose and my skin tone. And right there, it didn't matter if I was a Black person or not. Because I'm always looking for a race break where I, I, it doesn't matter what ethnic group I am. It was just me and them and the molas. It was quite amazing. Next. Now, when I talk about my having this needle and thread as my passport, it has led me into many very interesting tight spots where someone wants to find out how and what I did and why I was doing it. And in using that or showing my artwork, I got only, I not only got to talk about my personal history, but about the history of African-Americans, Africans, and of course, the United States. I was a weaver for years. Remember when I told you my mom, they picked cotton, they would keep the short ends of the cotton and twist it together. They would crochet those or they would uh, basket weave it, those around until they made little 
you know, shoes and they put a top on. It took me until my 74th year to realize they were making espadrilles. Ugh. They were. And they wore that most of the year. They were also basket weavers and they wove small things. In undergraduate school, I studied weaving. And when I went to graduate school, I studied more weaving and I was so entranced. You know, there's color and it's got oomph to it and I can make garments and it's really amazing. But I, Kumbaya, like many other hippies was looking for translucency. So I tried everything. I added beads to it, open space, you know, open work. I did nothing work next. And also with generally with weaving, you have to have a loom. And that means somebody has to warp it. Ugh. I studied traditional Western weaving on a floor loom. I studied traditional shoke weaving, uh, Nigerian strip weaving. I studied traditional Navajo weaving. And all of those things told me to get the hell off that loom. I even did beadwork on it. In 1976, I went back to Haystack Mountain School of uh, Crafts. It, it is, it was the bicentennial in 1976. And there I met Sandy, a Creek lady who taught me the peyote stitch. And I call it the peyote stitch because that's what I was told it is. And to honor those who taught me. But a more generic term is the diagonal weave because the beads fall on a diagonal, not vertically and horizontally the way they do on a loom. And that opens everything, guys. Because I no longer had to have a, a tool, an armature. I didn't need a loom or I didn't do fabric. My mom was my first bead teacher when I was around five and I had to sew on fabric. It was just the needle, the thread and the bead. And from that, I could be this improvisational Shecky Green. You're old enough to know who he was. So I'm showing you these two pieces because they're important to me. The piece on the left with all the lines is something that I gave to Michelle Obama. I sent it to the White House be a friend, we did all the right stuff. And I didn't hear from her for a year. I got, I'm like, somebody's in the kitchen cooking at Nichols, I'm very upset. Finally, I got a pair of earrings. I'm sorry, I got a, a note from her and I thought she doesn't want to talk to me, she just wants earrings matching. And the other is this lavender necklace. It has photographs in it. The back is as interesting as, the front and and I show this especially the students because I want them to know that sometimes you have to just leave your ego at the door now you're listening to me and you're like yeah right no when I go into the studio even though sometimes it's a fight I try to leave my craziness at the door and just go in and submit the materials into the process try to be more meditative and one with it and this necklace came out of it. I, I've never made one like it since or before. And the things that I learned in that process, uh, uh, it's held me in, in good stead throughout my work. Next, you know, I'll keep talking guys. I have to keep you out. Okay. I have been with Mobilia Gallery. They said for 40 years. I was like, what, what 40? I'm not even 40. Shut up. We're doing this show messages that's opening now. I worked all through COVID to finish the current pieces. I think jewelry can be as bombastic as right up front as solemn or subtle if you want it to be. I like jewelry as a storytelling mechanism, not only to talk about the wealth or how something feels against the body. I wanted to invite the viewer to come up and bodaciously say, hey, what are you wearing? What? what? And generally those people who will wear a necklace like this have the chutzpah to really talk about why they're doing it. Next, I want you to be overwhelmed in the beauty of what I make. 
I want you, all the oohs and ahs, I want you to say that's impossible. It was made by a robot. Not one person could do it, but that's not true because I just submitted to the process that ego gone. I want things to be really large if they need to be. I want them to be books. I want you to walk past the decooning and go, whatever that is over there, I'm going to see it. Next. I'm enthralled, overwhelmed in this great blessing that I've been given as a bead worker. And so I'm always challenging myself to go the next step, to add layers, to draw with, to suspend my, my disbelief about what I, this lowly human, can actually do. Next. Sometimes they tell stories. This is an older sculpture of mine that was from a series. I don't exactly what remember the series name, but this is about a woman who wants something but can't tell people. Next. Ha! Ah. My mother told me she took care of children. Even at a very young age. She said the most hurtful thing was when She'd raise a child and when it would begin to talk, it would call her a nigger. Now I use that word because I, 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 N-word is not what I hear when I hear N-word. And I want you to be stabbed just the way I'm stabbed when I hear it. Someone is teaching an infant to say that. I mean, the kid's not at the club at night at a basketball game or drinking. So my mom, who is everything to this child except a wet nurse, now is seeing what this baby might become. Next. I do work that is uh, politically oriented, socially oriented. That's because it's my best voice. I'm, I'm not uh, a politician. I don't have my own TV show. I don't teach a lot. So how do I talk about the, the issues that plague me? Because I'm still a citizen. I do it in my artwork. This comes from a series, Day After Rape. This is the Dafour section. A guy called the Jean Yui would drive camels into these small villages, kill the men, rape the women. The women would run off to immigrant camps, but they'd still have to go out to gather wood and water. They'd be raped sometimes, killed, slaughtered, sometimes placed in weird positions and maybe parts of them left with the kids who were there. Next. I believe that I should be talking about the human challenge, this challenge to be a human being, no matter who you are, no matter your ethnic group or your gender. In around five countries and more of the southern and the eastern part of Africa, there's the slaughter of albinos. I used to say, how do you look at someone who looks exactly like you except for their skin tone and slaughter them? And then I stepped back thinking, wait a second, Joy. I use monkeys a lot because they're tricksters. And they're also supposedly one of our closest relatives or our closest relatives. Sometimes I think a rat is too, but some people say that's an insult to rats. So this monkey has saved these two albino kids. And you know, monkeys do that. And I, I should say monkey is just a generic term. It could be an ape. It could be whatever the proper term is, but, but they would go into villages and steal babies. They would steal them to eat them. They'd play with them and hang out with them until the parents came and got them. This is a very large piece, and on the back are the country's names. Next. This is a conspiratorial practice. You may be coming home from from work and be waylaid on the road and have your arms cut off. And if somebody finds you, amen, you are taken to a hospital and you live the rest of your life with 
prosthetics or no arms. This is a woman taking her child to, to market. But in the basket that she's carrying on her head are the parts of a nine-year-old boy. I was spurred to begin this again, to start working on my sadness about this condition because I read that finally a young boy in Africa was murdered and his assailants were brought to justice. Next. When I talk about these things that uh, are scary, I want to make them as beautiful as possible. I want you to luxuriate in their beauty. I want you to be overcome by my skill. And I want you to also say, oh, hmm, is that really? This is another piece that started as a teapot. Ms. Teapot has a teapot on her head. I made it for the show. It got broken in transit. The bottom was uh, broken and cut off. This is the bottom beautifully beaded i couldn't fix it so i decided to build a whole piece this is a large piece too she's smoking cigarettes she's wearing sunglasses and all these people who are popping out of her i don't exactly know what that means next I've always wanted to do large wall hangings out of very small beads, just as if I were painting. And, and this is a form of painting for me, it's dry painting. Think about pointillism. I can't blend with wetness with color. So I have to mathematically surmise how to place tones and colors and textures together, just as if I were doing it wet, but doing it dry. This is a Harriet Tubman piece. I do a lot on Harriet Tubman because she makes me think of my mom and vice versa. This is around 40 inches wide. So it's a larger piece. Next. It's another wall hanging. This is the Blue Baby book. I, I made a book that, of a story that I made up in the, I think the seventies and I never sold it. And I looked at it and I was working decided to play with another piece that I'd made of a woman giving birth. And I realized I had this other book, so I just combined them. This is also around 40 or inches wide. Very small size 11 for beaters, beads and smaller. I like the open work. So it, if you can see the connection between my crocheting, my weaving, except I'm not using the hair of an animal, I'm using the, the sand, I'm using glass, next. And there's translucency, here's another one. This is a, over 40 feet long. Next. This is really large, I'm sorry that image is so small, but this is uh, Harriet's quilt. In the exhibition, it was spilling from a trunk, but whoever bought it really wanted it to hang on the wall. So I, I have a wonderful person I work with, Paul Daniel, he made a whole, you know, hanging apparatus for me that did not kill the beads. And this is made with large plastic beads, pony or crow beads. I am not a bead snob. I'll work with any material because it all comes from the earth. I don't think it comes from Mars. It comes from right here. So what am I talking about? Next. I was blessed to get a residency in Murano, Italy. You know, that's the land of glass. So you imagine this. I'm draped in velvet. I walk in. I'm thinking Italians love opera. I'm walking and I'm singing. They're like, I guess if I'm not, I'm not, da, da. okay. I kept working with them, you know, and they're like, that won't work. This won't work. Watch me now. And I made a lot of Buddhas. And they're like, why are you making Buddhas? And I'm, of course, you know, you can't tell me what to, it was more like 
Well, as an artist, all ideas, icons, imagery, I believe are open to me. And I use Buddha because he wasn't a god. He was just a really hip guy. I wanted to make a, a Buddha that represented summer. So that's what this Buddha is on fire in the hand. This is the Buddha that represents spring and summer. Next. I have a war woman series. Women have many different personas in war. I talked about in Dafur where they become the sexual pawns and uh, they they become the ones who last at the end of war as men are are killed or disappear. Women sometimes fight. That's an African sculpture. She's on a box that's covered with dice that talks about fortune and chance. The glass are guns and penises and heads. And she's carrying a heart as a backpack, a glass heart. Next. So I used to go to Penland a lot of summers and I would be teaching. And I take my mother with me. The first time I was there, we taught together. But as she started to progress with dementia, I would still take her. Penland was so fabulous. They allowed, they brought a house and they allowed me to bring a friend. And Olita Devane, who's also an artist, we drive down. My father lived in North Carolina. We stop. He was tell us the works just possible. And then we make that trek over the mountains from Durham going into um, uh, Asheville and Penland. And I stopped in one of those antique sideways stores. And there was this liquor bottle that was a hand holding a gun. And that was the first time I realized what a shot was. I have a shot at that. People actually used to put liquor in things. Oy. Well, this piece is about this young man, all the young men who are fighting in urban settings. And I'm from Baltimore, so there's a lot of that. He's blown his head off. Next. Harriet Tubman is Buddha, really large piece. Large plastic beads again, and she's holding a rosary that my mom made. Next. Aloft, blown glass. I'm inspired by Richard Jolly. He stacks heads on top of heads and, and I do them for different reasons because if I get a second head on top of one head, that means I already have the head that I'm, I can build a body on. This is important for me because uh, with this piece, it was a real um, continuation of my mosaicing beadwork and glass and other tchotchkes together. So this base is my making murals. Next, mosaics is the word I was looking for. So I come back from... Murano the second time, they're blowing these pieces for me. I'm looking at them. They're sort of what I want, but they're always just beginning forms. This is also a large piece that's 30 some inches tall. And anything that I have in the studio, because and the great piece about this is they did something frothy with the hair and when it started to break off it had holes in it and I could go back and beadwork that circle in the back of the head is just beaded through the broken glass and that's what I mean about being that one where I have the, the temerity to say I'm gonna stick some beads in the broken glass head yeah I I I shall not be denied I don't want to be perplexed and not find a way out which leads me to the next perplexing situation. Next. I also do a lot of fusing and making and jumping. I do not believe this piece is finished, so I'll work on it again. But back and forth, Janice figures, all the stuff that you we did in, you know, actually all cultures. I about to say, oh, those older Europeans, but everybody does that. Next. 
I have a floor at the Reagan Airport, a floor mosaic. I tell everybody, go. This is the only time you'll be able to walk on me. Because then, got it. Okay, next. I'm making myself laugh. I was asked to have an exhibition at Grounds for Sculpture, which is a sculpture park in New Jersey. Am I wrong? No, I'm not. It's next to, it's really close to Princeton. And of course, I was on my Harriet Tubman thing. So this is called Harriet Tubman and Other Truths. I said to them, they said, firstly, you can do whatever you want. Now you, you've been with me for 15 minutes. You know, that's the wrong thing to say. So I said, I want a big dirt 15 foot Harriet Tubman. We'll give you 10 feet. You said I could do whatever I want. Fitting. So we made a 15 foot Harriet Tubman made out of soil. I had a dirtologist because we were making this last until the end of the show. It had graffiti on it, beadwork pressed into it next. It even is surrounded by the plants because I worked with their arborist. The plants that Harriet Tubman would walk through and buy to get from Maryland to South Carolina and back. She shone in the sunshine. She, she was covered with snow in the winter and she kept slowly disappearing. The beads dropped off and the graffiti would start to disappear and just her shape was there. She's also holding a 10 foot rifle that's Latex that's made out, not latex, that's lucite that's made out of all kinds of things that we've stuffed into it. Next. And then I did another Harriet. This one is 10 feet. We cast it. I worked with the, the craftsman there. She's holding a veve, which is a, a power stick. That's a good way to explain it another gun, she's got mirrors on her dress. She's standing on quilt tops that my mother's, my father's mother made, my paternal grandmother. And in the tree, in the very back, you'll see a, a kind of lumpy form. It's an 11 foot Hank. Hank is a ghost. They used to follow people supposedly home from picking. And, uh, uh, they cross water to get away from Hanks because Hanks usually can't get there. But they were on the same side. They get trapped in those bottle trees. That's where bottle trees came from, supposedly, here in the United States. The idea that when you're walking home, this glistening thing would entrance them and they go up the bottle, but they couldn't figure out how to get out next. I'm also a printmaker, I can finally say that. I didn't say I was a good printmaker, but I am a printmaker. When Obama came in, they talked about his ears. So I made a series of prints with ears. This one is he as Buddha. I did him as Yoda. I think Mickey Mouse even, next. I'm doing a series. This is just the beginning of the patron saints of hip hop and the fallen angels. So this is uh, Biggie Smalls with his wife and Faith Evans and Lil Kim, drugs. This is one of the plainer ones and I'm happy about how they're evolving into something else. It's beginning, supposed to look like papyrus. Next. I was also a performer for many years. I still sing and I talk my friends to death with my jokes. But I don't do uh, theater anymore. The, the two people, that's Kayla Wall and I, and we were the Thunder Thigh Review for years, traveling around the United States, Canada, Scotland, Holland, performing the shows that we wrote. This was all of the 80s. So this is a really fertile time, for bing bing, a fertile time with people like Kathy and Mo and and all of the women performers. And it allowed us to go to many places. Then I worked with another group called uh, Honey Child Milk, which was in quotes the truth, 
a, a, a coon show. We made all these horrible jokes and they were all related to gender, race, bias, you name it. Next. I did a lot of one performance, one person performance for around five years after that. Now, when people ask me if there's anything you regret, I say my one person performances. My friends were so fabulous to just come and watch me do these things. Out of them came some really good short written pieces. One of my performance partners now is Lorraine Whittlesey and we're called Ebony and Irony, get it? We do a lot of her songs, did a lot of her songs before COVID and uh, also show tunes next. I still work with younger folks. Sometimes they'll ask me to come and work with them doing some hip hop stuff because I do a lot of scatting and I can improv things. It's Jasmine Sullivan. Next. Before I go into this one, I have to say, I also have a pianist named The Piano Man, Derek Thompson, who I worked with for a long time and it's the best thing ever when you work with somebody and you do this, screen, 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 and they go, got it. Dun, go, dun, dun. Folks, remember earlier I said I will not be denied and that I feel that I'm on this path where I'm the one, not the only one, but I don't want to look back and say that I lived a mediocre or halfway life. I want my shoes to be all ripped up from my travails and nah, I just get a new pair of shoes. Around five years ago, I, I was asked by a, a beat artist, Shoda K. Talia Farah, if I would work with a Tubin group, and that, that throat singers. They're from Russia and they live very traditional lives, herding and everything when they're in Russia, but when they're traveling the world, they're doing traditional work and their contemporary music. So, hey, I'm singing with them. We even have a, a record out and I think they are trying to get it to be considered for the Grammys. Did my life. I've done film, television, radio, you name it, theater, visual arts, and I'm an example of how, if you believe this is there for you, go get it. Next. My mom had a retrospective and, and then she started to really present with uh, dementia. 14 years to progress from, you know, the beginning to the very end. This is near the end. We're in our living room. Uh, my mom taught me something, and I like to end my shows with this. My mom said, you have a light, a very bright light. Now, my parents and many people's lights weren't extinguished. They were just hidden under a basket. That's what they would say. Don't hide your, your light under no basket. Theirs were hidden because uh, they didn't have academic education because of the color of their skin and the overt kind of exertion of power by those who had it and could make them submit to it. I'm not under a bushel. If you can't cop a hit off this flame, then back off. Cause this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, Ooh. let it shine. That's the end, guys. Oh, look how big my face is. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was really beautiful and wonderful. Thanks. For my family, I moved my head. It's perfect. So I really appreciate you spending the time to give us that kind of really great insight and overview into your life and your world. 
Um, I'm opening it up for questions. We've got lots of applauses and thank yous on the chat. And so here's your first question. Your work is so expressive. Can you please talk about your use of color? My father used to say, can you just wear one color, maybe two? He really was, you know, very conservative. I think that color is, is so expressive and speaks when you're not there. So it allows me to have full range in this, in my vocabulary, in my lexicon. It allows me to use all of that. And while you're looking at it, then you maybe will respond to a tonal change or the way I've made some kind of pattern. And that, that's like my overt reason. The, the other reason is just because I can. Because we're living in the 21st century. I, I always thought I was going to stop buying beads. I have so many beads. But beads are uh, really being made now, reinvented. The Japanese are doing different things. The Czechs have figured out. Okay, the Italians are like, we're not doing it. Okay, I mean, little seed beads. So every time I think I'm not going to buy anything, I buy something else because I can, just like a, a painter who would sit down and, you know, add green and blue together and come out with a teal or something. I can't do that because it's not wet. So I have to always be exploring the opportunities that I can have by using beads, their color, you know, their texture, their form, their shape. That's amazing. Um, more questions? Any other questions? Everyone's saying thank you. They're all very. Dear Pammy, guys, you should ask me one or two more questions. Oh, can you remind us of your mother's name? I was a little Elizabeth Caldwell Halford, T A L F O R D Scott. And it's almost always Elizabeth Talford Scott. Okay. Um, there were beads in the blue glass Buddha. Were they inside the Buddha or behind it? Behind it. If the, it had a front and the back. So it was really a, a fish that was from the head down and the fish had little hands sticking out of it. I'm a rascal. <laughs> um, did Obama, Michelle Obama, ever get your earrings or get the earrings? I'm not sending her earrings. <laughs> I'm, have you seen what she looks like now? <laughs> I don't really know if she was allowed to. I always wonder if you're allowed to keep certain jewelry if because that was a very expensive piece. So maybe that's now in some kind of collection and in the White House. But um, I would. Maybe it's in his library. But White House does have a curator. Yeah. Um, well, be yeah. Do you have mentees who are following and building on your creative path? I'm always trying to to extend my my knowledge of and my joy about beadwork, and I'm also now trying to make sure that I have more and more African American mentees because I mean really folks I taught for many many years I used to be away for almost half the month you know you go out you work you come home you go out and I really stopped because my mom said you have to stop now there's something not right with me I said give me one more year mom and she did and I made a chunk of money and then I I stayed home but the majority of my students were um uh, white they weren't black mm -hmm. they weren't brown mm -hmm. so my knowledge is to make sure that everybody gets a little bit of joy so that is what i'm trying to do i actually right now am mentoring i call it sideways mentoring because they're adults but i had the opportunity to show their work to a museum and what I thought would be just like an introduction 
ended up being uh, a mentoring kind of thing. We put together a group and now we work together. We're doing polymer next month and we talk about beadwork and how to structure jewelry and the whole thing. So the answer is yes. But I've always, uh, you know, said to someone who's like, hey, you know, Joyce, I, I'd really like to do that. Come on over to the studio and I'll show you. Um, a question about what, your habit. Whoops, sorry. And what good is it for me to have it? I mean, what do I, I am not an, a, and, and I understand it by, from those who do it, but I'm not someone who just holds these secrets or all of that stuff, because that's not how I was taught. I was taught when I talk about Sandy, who was a Creek um, native, an indigenous lady, we were really hanging out and she taught me that and it changed everything for me in fact i talked to her last week after not seeing her for probably almost 10 years uh, so it doesn't behoove me to hold anything it doesn't make a bit of difference when i'm croaked and dead so what so it's if i have this knowledge uh I should share it. Yes. You had another one. Uh, oh, you've got I, a bunch coming. So the next one, um, use of, do you use thread or wire to string your beads or both? I use thread and I use uh, fishing lines called fire line and there are other names for it. And that is a wire, a very thin fishing line. You can't, uh, you mostly can't use wire because it stiffens up and it has to be annealed and you anneal with fire and then you're blowing up everything. So I use very strong thread. The thread that I like the most is silamide, S-I-L-A-M-I-D-E. It's a tailor's thread. But I was given a lot of Nymo, which I never liked because I thought it was like um, dental floss and some other thread. And I thought, I mean, it was like spools and spools, guys. It's like, uh, the spools everywhere. And I thought, now I'll give some away, but aren't I a fool to have this wonderful present given to me and be snooty about it? So now I figured out how to work with Nymo, and it comes in a lot of um, colors too. And I buy this fire line on a giant spool like this. It comes in different weights. There are cheaper brands, and I say that to you because since COVID, this has gone from like $59 for that spool to 150, something so outrageous that I, I bit the bullet and bought two of those spools and now I'm investigating uh, less expensive ones like this one called spider wire. It comes in green, it comes in different ways because it, um, unless someone is, you know, you just, it's just ridiculous to pay that much. And let me say, I don't do a single strand. I do a double strand always. And sometimes depending upon the weight, of the thread and the size of the hole in the bead, I might even do double that and have four strands going in, which means there are eight strands inside of the bead and it should last for a really long time. Um, let's see what's next. What comes to you first, a concept, a story you want to create or a process you want to explore? I don't. It just all is in there, Kent, and you guys, it's all in there. So sometimes something happens and I end up having a series happen because I didn't say what, what should work the very first time. Uh, sometimes I'll be beating the hell out of a piece and it's not, not only not that piece, it's a print or it's something that I have to write about, you know? So whatever, however it pops up, now, this is when I, not too long ago, I've been waking up with jokes and I call my friends right away. I wake up as if I've been um, doing stand up. 
okay, here's a joke. <laughs> my friend said, where did you do this? I was in my dreams. I was just doing a whole show. And uh, so then I'm thinking about how to do that. And, and when I pray, I talk to God directly. And, you know, we have conversations. I'm trying to stay out of detention in heaven and a whole thing. And that becomes a, a whole story, too. She keeps looking back because, what's your husband's oh. name? Philip. Well, the, the dog is barking now. <laughs> I can hear the dog. There's a dog. There's a child running around breaking things. And her husband keeps coming, shaking the child vigorously. I'm calling the police after that. No, I'm not. No, uh, he's he's doing a good job of trying to keep them quiet, but the dog sometimes has her own mind. <laughs> um, <I can't. laughs> let's see. Uh, if we wanted to see your art in person, where do we go? Well, that's a well, mostly go to the museum. Exactly. That's what, uh, buy the catalog. The catalog is so inexpensive, and um, there, you know, I can tell you the different museums they're in, but they're you know museums they're not out. I have three galleries that you could, if you're in town, you could go and they would present work to you. One is Mobilia Gallery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Another is Peter Blum in New York. And my home gallery here in Baltimore is Goya Contemporary. I have a piece at the Met. Think about that, y'all. Have a piece at the Met. And I say that I'm in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I say that because I'm going back to my very first statements about my being around the girl, way girl who lived across the street from the projects. So when I am talking to younger students or to anybody who's on that quest, it can happen. The fact that I have a MacArthur means that I stayed the course. And I used to make jokes, folks. I used to say with a bunch of artists, who do I have to have sex with to get my neck? All right, there. Ha, ha, ha. We all laugh at it. Then I got old, so that was not possible. And I would say, who do I have to pay to impersonate me so I can get that money? And then once I was at the Ford Foundation talking trash, and this woman said, I work at the MacArthur. But I got it after that, actually. And I didn't have to lay with anybody, but I'm always... Um on this quest, that's it. I, I, I will not be denied and I don't see mistakes. I see them as opportunities. I fall down, I get up with the assistance now because my knees are bad and I just keep trekking. Yes. Um, next question, I'm not sure. Uh, are you or do you plan to get involved with crafting the future or better together? What are they? I don't know. Crafting the future. Sounds like an initiative about craft and future ideas and art to be my guess. But that's a question. I, think look that, I actually think I got something for that from someone. I don't know. I am working on my on another exhibition that opens in 24 and it's knocking me out. So I don't know how much of that and being a mentor here I could be. And my mother also, there's 25th anniversary of her retrospective here in Baltimore, and that's going to open and it's going to be at an institution. And then also other places will have one of her artworks and they'll build uh, all kinds of uh, public stuff around it and interacting with students. That's gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna be busy. <laughs> Sounds like it. Do <laughs> um, you have someone who also wants to be a mentee, who's Black and wants to be a mentee, wants to know how to connect with you? Well, you can get in touch with me via my gallery, Goya Contemporary. They're online. Mm -hmm. G-O-Y-A, yep. Yes. We talked a little bit about what you're working on now. Obviously, very busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, you will, folks. I'm actually <laughs> in one of my studios. So like I have a three-story row house in Baltimore, but it's an old woman. It's like probably built 1800s to beginning of the 1900s. Then, excuse me, I bought the house next door like this and put doors in between. 
and made studios and everything and all of these. When my knees started to get bad, I started working in the old dining room, which ended up being my mother's bedroom because we couldn't go upstairs anymore. And I just can't get myself out of here. So sometimes I'm working on the third floor and the second floor, but I work on a lot because her picture's down here, I'm sure. But I'm working on another really big wall hanging. Look at the color of those beads. Isn't that wild? What what this is this is what entrances me. So I'm working on a, actually two very large wall hangings, uh, combining some uh, hand, I'm making prints. I'm just doing everything for this project that I'm doing in, in 24. And I can't tell you everything because they haven't released it yet and they'll yell at me. Because I said, can't I tell, no, dang. <laughs> um, I'm trying to write more because I keep coming up with these funny stories. And we talk, we're talking about my doing a comic book. And then we talked about my doing, you know, I wrote a book called uh, um, Beadwork and Drawings from Hell in 94. And it was actually a, a graphic novelette <laughs> with drawings and my musings. We've been talking about my, since I've learned a lot more since then, really doing a second book. I have to stay still long enough. And when you look at my artwork, you see how long it takes. So I may say things like, and I shall write a book. I don't know when, you know. And I do 99% of the work myself. So when people say mentor, you, you might be surprised at what you have to do. Pick that up, damn it. I do like to teach, but I, I really make most of the work myself, unless it's just big fields of like blue or something, because that's, it's my voice. Absolutely. Um, do you work every day? Every day. Sometimes just a couple of hours. Like last night, I didn't go to bed until probably five. It was actually later than that because the sun was coming up. And I don't like that. I was assiduously trying to go to bed by one. And then I started working on these wall hangings and I'm back in the jackpot, as it were. But I'll straighten myself out. I don't think that's good. It's not good for you to do that. Oh, and I'm also working with Tim Tate at the Washington Glass Studio right outside of um, DC on a giant wall quilt and it's um past glass and my bead work it's a collaborative piece between he and i so it's our class cast glass mixed together it's i'm amazed i just came back from a 10-day residency at the toledo museum in their glass studio and here's the thing that just it made me so hot, I had orgasms the whole time. You're all adults, I can speak to you in this manner. So when I went to uh, Morano and I told you they gave me the stink guy, it's because I didn't have beads that were chemically compatible with their glass. When I went back the second time, I came with antique Italian beads that were more compatible, okay? Right. So I'm still trying to do stuff, right? I'm always, it's all hit and miss about whether I can fuse my beadwork to the glass. I go to Toledo. I have all these check faces and things that I've made. And I brought all these beads to work with. And they're, the glass recipe is from Czechoslovakia. I plots. I was crazy. Everything worked together. I was the happiest person ever. So now with a very successful, think about my beadwork on the surface. And when you blow things, they get bigger. So then we can, and we did big rondelles or 
flat circles where my my beadwork is like made uh, faces. All of this just opened a giant door. I hope to go back. And now I'm going to start experimenting with them too. That sounds amazing. Um, yes, this exhibition, it's the same exhibition will be going to the Fuller Craft Museum. Um, as well as to the Crocker in California. Yeah. Yep. So hitting all the, the parts of the best parts of America, right? <laughs> Yeah, may I like to say something? I got an itchy nose. Someone just, a friend that I knew from elementary school, when you, if you buy this catalog, you'll see a picture of me in the back when I'm like seven or eight. And my nose doesn't even exist. You know, they talk about button nose. We were trying to figure out when this aquila line, which means hawk like, when this schnozola popped out of my head. I think it must have been junior high school. And I think I woke up one day and there was something on the pillow and it was my nose. Anyway, um, I can't, I, I firstly, I thank you for coming because I can't tell you how blessed and in wonderment I am every day of, of my life. I'm the right person for this job to be able to have lived loved as I was by my parents and friends, very supported by my teachers and schools and friends. And to have this ability with these two hands and this broken brain, it's a joy every day. And I am old enough and ridiculous enough to be able to say with um, great joy laced with hubris that I don't want to be one of them. I want to be the one. I don't know why else I'm alive. I don't know why I should settle for less, especially since I've been given this great skill. And uh, I intend to keep persevering. And so who knows what my art will look like next year. You'll, like, you'll see something, you'll go, what is she doing? She's welcoming. I'm not welding, but I'm employing someone to weld some things for me. If you saw this work with Tim Tate, which I, I, I just, we haven't finished. So I, it's not in, in this slideshow. You go like, what? I've never seen that before. Firstly, probably nobody's ever done this before the way we're doing it. And I don't know if anybody else is doing what I'm doing with beads and glass. But here's my point, why not me? And I say that to all the kids who ask me, well, what, well why not you? Why not, isn't that what my life's about? And I know you, I see that there are people who are my age here and some a little bit older, I could be wrong about that. So I know you've lived that life where you've been on that quest and you know what I mean. So my life is to not stop. I tell people if I am buried, I'll have a voice activated thing that when you get right to my headstone is gonna go like, damn. But I'll probably have to be burned because I, my mother, I, you know, she was cremated so I probably will. You can still put something somewhere that will remind people of your presence. I'm sure, but I'm telling you, you, you see my personality. So people are like, no, thanks. We've had enough. Um, it looks like Crafting the Future is working to diversify the fields of art, craft, and design by connecting BIPOC artists with opportunities. So that's interesting for you and your mentee. Um, there was a question about that piece that you were holding up, that wall piece. Was that the silami thread? used on that one. This is basically the fire line. Okay. And it's basically that because I'm almost completely ensured that that's not gonna break. And remember, it's gonna be hanging up. But I tell you, uh, the silamide is very strong. And here's one of the differences. Silamide is a, a spun thread, not threads next to each other. So there's a bounce to it. So when you're sewing, you can get uh, uh, it would be tauter. I have to sometimes pull and over pull because 
this is something you have to pull like this. It doesn't spring. But the other thing because of that is because it's like fishing line. To hold a big carp, or I just said carp, I don't know how big carps are, <laughs> but you know, a giant fish or octopus or something. So it'll, and it will last for a long while too. That's fantastic. Let's see. Oh, do your hands ever fail you? These babies never fail me, but they do hurt sometimes. And so I wear, I was looking to see if it was right. Here, here it is. Sometimes I wear a little cheap kind of lace, and then I have some other gloves. You know, I'm always looking for something. And then this is a, <laughs> I don't know if you know, but I'm gorgeously fat, is the word I could lie to you, but that's what I am. So I got these knee things, right? And they were too small. So I wear them on my upper arm you know, the compression things, and it helps because you, it's, you know, I'm not doing this, I'm doing this, and I do get stuck sometimes. Um, I do heat sometimes on my hands, and you know what? I'm smart enough to stop. It's another thing. That's always a good thing to know. I would also wonder about your eyes. I worked with beads, uh, seed bead ones, and it was the last time because then I, of course, found them everywhere because I kept dropping them because I couldn't see them. And they were in my like carpet and in my couch. I would find one a year later. I'm like, how is this still here? Well, possibly you shouldn't work on a couch. I don't want to make a deal. I should just tell you. Well, I don't have pets because, you know, they lick the beads get in their fur and they lick it off and they can't pass it and it gets stuck in their intestines and then you either have to put them down or pay thousands of dollars to get that worked out i just have to tell you that my entire house looks like a bomb shelter because there are beads everywhere and you're sliding and there's stuff everywhere because i'm always i'm like you know that dog squirrel i'm over there uh, my eyes are fine. Actually, I have to have a, what is it called when you get a new lens? Cataracts. Cataracts. But they're all like, you know, you do it when you can't do, feel and you, that's okay. Well, but I, I'm just, we're readers. I can see close up pretty well and I wear readers. You know, I'm, telling you, I'm the person for this job until I'm not. Then I'll do something else. Then I guess I'll, uh, or I'll just sit around and tell you guys, which you guys are schmucks. When I was 27, when I was, I'm waiting to be that person. When I was <laughs> 74, I was. And have my own TikTok thing where you had those old people on TikTok doing to Beyonce. That's me. That's me in the future. Well, I'm glad you have future plans for yourself <laughs> outside of this. <laughs> Ruling the world, yes. Sounds like a good plan. Um, everyone says thank you. And this was a really wonderful talk and, and wonderful to hear you and to hear about your life and your stories and to see a little bit more into your art. And I know a lot of people are going to come and be kind of blown away by what you have out there. I know everyone that sees it when I talk to them just can't even fathom what it takes to make something so amazingly gorgeous and intricate and and just your ability is awe-inspiring. And I really want to say thank you for both the exhibition and also talking to us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, this is being recorded and will be up on our, I think our YouTube channel and you can access it from our website so that at University Museums so that you can continue to share your message um, throughout time and it will be there for as long as I guess we're there for now. And um, people will be able to access it. So if you missed it or you want someone else to see it, please feel free to look it up. It'll probably be in a couple of weeks that it goes up. But thank you again, Joyce. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. It was an honor. And I'm looking at myself. I'm much better looking than this. I don't know. <laughs> you look gorgeous. <laughs> don't worry about it. Thank you to everyone for coming too. I really appreciate you spending time with us.